In today's video, we're just going to briefly look at the importance of properly compensating your 10x probes. I did a video a while back on the basics of 10x probes and what compensation actually does, and I'll link that video down below. But today, I just want to briefly cover what can happen if you don't properly compensate them. And the reason for this is because compensating the probes is one of those things that uh, is very easy to forget about and neglect doing. You know, many times because we uh, list place the small little screwdrivers that come with the probes to set the compensation in the first place, or we just figure it doesn't matter. So we'll just take a look at why it does matter. You know, not properly compensating the probes can lead to the amplitude of signals being wrong, depending on their frequency. Also, signals can get distorted. And what we want to do when we're compensating the probes is to ensure that the capacitance ratio of you know, this combination of parallel capacitances here is ratioed with the uh, shunt capacitance around the 9 mega ohm resistor in essentially this relationship. Uh, where this resistor ratio has got a 9 to 1, we want this capacitance ratio to also have a 9 to 1 ratio, but essentially in reverse as shown in the uh, equation here. Of course, some 10x probes will have you the adjustment for the probe compensation located near the probe tip. In other cases, it'll be located on the what's called the compensation box or the connector where you're connecting this, the probe to the scope. Uh, in that particular case, when you have the adjustment located near the scope end, uh, typically there is a fixed capacitance at the probe tip inside the probe body itself and then adjusting this capacitor is essentially adjusting the total capacitance at this end uh, essentially of the equation to get the capacitance ratio appropriate. But in either case it's important to adjust uh, that capacitor to properly compensate the probe to get good results. At signal frequencies below a few kilohertz the probe attenuation is essentially dominated by these resistor values. The 9 mega ohm resistor that's in the probe tip and the 1 mega ohm uh, input impedance of the scope. Because these capacitors are relatively low values and their capacitive reactance is very large at these very low frequencies. However, once uh, frequencies get above just a few kilohertz, the capacitors start dominating. The capacitive reactance starts dominating essentially the divide ratio. A way to think about this is that uh, a typical you know, input capacitance of a high bandwidth scope might be you know, 15 picofarads. Well, the capacitive reactance of 15 picofarads is equal to 1 mega ohm at just 10 kilohertz. So that 1 mega ohm input uh, capacitive reactance is equal to the 1 mega ohm input impedance. So essentially the input impedance here is dropped by a factor of 2 at just 10 kilohertz. So we can see that the effect of these capacitances really t uh, start coming in at just some very low frequencies, just even below, uh, just below 10 kilohertz. And certainly once you get above 10 kilohertz, the uh, divide ratio of the probe is dominated by those capacitors. So if they're not adjusted right when you're setting up the probe compensation, the amplitude readings will be off. So let's take a look at a couple of quick examples. And so I've got a pair of Tektronix P6133 probes connected up to the scope here. And uh, I've got the, the output of a signal generator coming through this uh, exposed transmission line, which is then coupled right into the scope into channel 3, so we can monitor the waveform directly from uh, the signal generator on the scope. And we'll use the probes to probe what's going on on the transmission line. And so I've got the AFG producing a 100 hertz uh, sine wave here, and we can see that on channel 3. And if I take these two probes, which are not properly compensated, and uh, if I probe uh, this one here onto channel 1, I can actually see that uh, the waveform is basically identical. It kind of is landing right behind channel 3. We can just barely see it. And if we look at uh, this one here on channel 2, that one is also right there as well. So at 100 hertz, everything is fine. So the fact that these probes are not properly compensated doesn't really matter so much. Okay, so let's take the uh, waveform frequency from 100 hertz to, say, 10 kilohertz. Still a, a pretty low frequency signal here, you know, certainly within the audio range. Now let's take a look at these two probes. Remember, they both read uh, about the same at 100 hertz. Let's take a look at this probe here connected to channel 1. And we can see its amplitude is actually quite a bit lower than the uh, input signal that we see on channel 3. 
if we take uh, this probe here connected to channel 2 and connect that one up here to the line, we can see that one is actually quite a bit higher than the uh, channel 3 waveform. So these two probes, which both measure proper amplitude at 100 hertz, are reading quite different at just 10 kilohertz. Let's take the signal frequency up to, say, 1 megahertz and uh, speed the scope up here so we can see that. And let's look at those same two probes again. So this one here from channel 1, again, that's still reading low, about the same amount that it did at 10 kilohertz. And let's take a look at the other probe here, and it's reading high. Again, also about the same as it was reading at 10 kilohertz. And all this makes sense because now we're dominated, uh, or I should say the attenuation of the probes is dominated by that capacitance ratio. Uh, so uh, again, above just a few kilohertz, all the way up into a megahertz and well beyond here, that capacitance ratio is determining the signal amplitude and therefore will cause your readings to be wrong if the probe isn't compensated right. Now this is what it looks like for a single frequency input, but if you have more complex waveforms, digital waveforms, you know, square waves or logic waveforms, not only will the amplitudes be wrong, but you can also get distortion of the waveforms. Let's take a quick look at that. I'm going to change the signal frequency back down to just one kilohertz and change the waveform type to a square wave. And we'll just uh, slow the scope down here so we can actually see uh, the square wave signal. So this is our input waveform that's going through the transmission line here. And let's probe it with the two probes here. So with channel one, we can see this waveform is distorted. Uh, we're not reaching full amplitude and we're kind of getting this RC response up to the full amplitude. Again, it indicates that the probe is undercompensated and the high frequency components are being attenuated. And if we uh, take a look at the other probe here, which is on the other end of the extreme, you know, that one here now, we're, we're seeing the high frequency components are overcompensated and then we're tailing down to the proper response. And of course, a one kilohertz square wave is often what is used to help you adjust the probe compensation uh, uh, for this very reason. It's got a low enough frequ fundamental frequency that we can actually see you know, the attenuation dominated by the resistors by the time the, the pulse has reached its end point here. But we also can see the high frequency effects of not having the capacitors adjusted right. So this is why a, you know, a one kilohertz square wave is often used to compensate the probes. Okay, so let's properly compensate this probe here to kind of illustrate how everything comes into line if you properly compensate things. So I'm just going to uh, take my probe diddle stick here, drop it in here, and if we adjust the probe compensation, I can make that waveform basically match. If I overcompensate, undercompensate, go back and forth until I get this thing basically perfect. Should be right about there. So now if we change waveforms, we should be able to see it match at all frequencies and all waveforms. All right, so let's change the waveform type back to a sine wave like we were looking at earlier. And uh, of course now uh, you know, the waveform matches here perfectly. I'll just turn off channel 2 so it's out of our way. And uh, let's go back to the AFG and change the signal frequency, say from 1 kilohertz. Let's go back to 10 kilohertz we were looking at earlier. Okay, we can actually see that waveform lands right on top of channel 3. It's the right amplitude. And uh, let's go up back to, say, 1 megahertz. All right speed the scope up here and we can actually see that waveform lands basically right on top of that as well. Now something else to remember is that a, a very high bandwidth probe isn't always better. Uh, for example, if you get a, you know, a, a nice 350 megahertz probe or 500 megahertz probe and you want to use it with your 100 megahertz scope, that may not always be better. Uh, the reason is, is that the probe may not have enough compensation range in the adjustable capacitor, depending on where it's located, to compensate for the input capacitance of, the, of a low bandwidth scope. Because low bandwidth scopes generally have a larger input capacitance on the scope side. And if the probe can't po compensate for it, you're going to result in a low amplitude at higher frequencies, kind of a low pass filter. So it's kind of uh, ironic that a very high bandwidth probe might actually give you worse frequency response and uh, a lower amplitude at high frequencies than a a lower bandwidth probe might do, and that's just because it can't be properly compensated. So let's take a quick look at that. Okay, so here's a, uh, a P6139B uh, probe hooked into my uh, 2465 scope. You can read here that the input capacitance of the scope is 15 picofarads. And if we take a look at uh, 
Now the probe compensation here, I can see I can properly compensate this. There I was undercompensated and there I'm overcompensated. If I adjust this just right, I can properly compensate that probe and this will give me a good flat frequency response out to you know, 300 megahertz bandwidth of this particular scope. Let's move this probe to a different scope. Okay, here's the same probe now hooked into the 465B scope. 465B's input capacitance is 20 picofarads. So we uh, hook the probe up here and take a look. I can see it's obviously not uh, properly compensated right now. Let's actually go try to adjust that. We can actually see that I can undercompensate the scope just, probe just fine. If I try to properly peak it, I don't quite reach full amplitude there. I can see a little bit of droop in that waveform here and here. So the bottom line is this scope, or excuse me, this probe does not have enough compensation range to compensate for the 20 picofarad input capacitance of this particular scope. So in fact, if we take uh, the instruction manual for this probe and take a look at the specification page, we can actually see that the compensation range of the P6139B is 8 picofarads to 18 picofarads. And since the input capacitance of this scope is 20 picofarads, that's beyond the compensation range uh, of this probe. So uh, we're at, kind of out of luck. So this is an example where a high bandwidth 500 megahertz probe is not going to be better when used with a lower bandwidth scope. So you do have to be careful about that. So I hope you enjoyed and got something out of this little tutorial on why you want to properly compensate your probes and what happens if you don't and also to recognize that it's important to take a look at the specifications for the probes you're using like these P6133's and actually take a look and see what the rated compensation range is uh, for that probe to see if the input capacitance of your scope falls within that range. If it doesn't, you're not going to be able to properly compensate that probe and you're going to get inaccurate amplitude measurements and possible distortion in your signals. So if you're shopping for probes for your oscilloscope, make a note of your scope's input capacitance and then make, a, make it a point to take a look at the rated compensation range for those probes. Anyway, thanks again for watching. Uh, please subscribe if you haven't done so already. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up and we'll see you next time. Thank you.